In Jerusalem, the supply of grain dwindled. Day after day, John Mark waited at the gates of the city, seeking news of the caravan from Antioch. And day after day, he was forced to return home without success. I've had no word yet of the caravan, but I'm sure it won't be long before help arrives from Antioch. I can no longer believe that help will come, John Mark. But it was promised. Yes, it was promised over a year ago when they warned us of famine to come. But nothing has happened, and our food is gone. We have a little grain left. It isn't enough to keep our children alive. They've forgotten us at Antioch. Yes, they've forgotten us. I'm not going to wait any longer. I'm going to the temple. You'll pay high for any grain the priests give you at the temple. Don't you know they'll force you to renounce Jesus for food? Then I'll renounce him. I'm beginning to think they're right, Mother. Mark. How can anyone expect help to come? It's against all reason to expect anyone in Antioch to send food here to people they've never even known. We must have faith, Mark. The Lord is watching over us and those that promise to help. We must not despair. Mary is right. I am ashamed of having doubted, even for a moment, that God will help us. Let us pray to him. Let us ask for his forgiveness. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. During the months of famine, Saul and Barnabas faithfully fulfilled their mission. And when at last the rains came, bringing new life to the parched earth, they knew the time had come for their return to Antioch. Tomorrow, then, you leave for Antioch? Yes, Mary. We'll be sorry to see you go, Mark and I. It's lonely here sometimes without our friends. And even Peter is away in Jerusalem most of the time. We think of you and of our other friends here often, Mary. Thank you, Sal. I shouldn't complain of loneliness as long as Mark is with me. Mother, there's something I want to say to you. What is it, Mark? Before Aram left for Antioch yesterday with the caravan, he told me he had been a pagan until he talked with you. And you taught him of God and of our Lord. Yes, that's true, Mark. It made me realize how important it is for you and Barnabas and Peter and the others to go to foreign lands to teach of Jesus. I understand how great and important your work is, and I'd like to help. Mark. I've tried not to speak of this, Mother, because I knew how you'd feel. But I believe it's right for me to go. There must be many ways in which I can help you and Barnabas Saul. Many things I can do. If you feel it is right for you to go, Barnabas and Saul think that you can help, then it's right that you should go. A man must choose his own work. And I'm proud, Mark, that you wish to work for our Lord. Thank you, Mother. Can I be of help to you? May I go with you to Antioch? Do you want to help in this work so much that you'd be unhappy if you didn't go, Mark? Yes, I've felt this way for a long while. I've thought of doing other things, of course. I suppose everyone does at times. But I know now that I want to help in the work that you and Barnabas are doing. Nothing else is important to me. Then there is work for you to do, Mark. For you and all men who feel as you do, we'll be glad to have you go with us to Antioch. All night I prayed that I wouldn't weaken and beg him to stay here. I suppose all mothers feel that way when their sons go away from home. Yes, I think they must. I thought that he would stay here in our own city and do the work of our Lord. 
Now I know Mark feels he must carry the teachings of Jesus to other lands. It is right that he should go. Mark is fortunate in having a mother who understands. It will help him always, wherever he may be. I'll leave you now, Mary. Peace be with you. And with you, Sal. Mother, we're, we're ready to leave now. Yes, I know. Mother, if, if you'll be very lonely and unhappy, I, I'll stay here. No. You mustn't stay here. I'm proud of you, son. You must go to Antioch. And may God protect you and keep you. Peace be with you. They called us Christians at Antioch, but I didn't know that even the small children shouted the name in scorn. They mean no harm. They resent us because they do not understand. <laughs> Why do they call them Christians? Who are they? I don't know much about them. Whenever you see men and women in plain garments, such as the robes those men are wearing, you can be sure they're Christians. They believe in some god or other, someone they call Christ. You think it's strange that we whom you call Christians wear simple robes. It is because we do not value worldly treasures. They are not important. Perhaps you will understand if you will remember that we brought nothing into the world and it is certain that we take nothing out. And so we are content. We do not want to gain riches because the love of money is the root of all evil. It brings unhappiness and sorrow to those who possess it. We live in the promise of salvation, a promise given us by God, the living God, who sent his only son to save us from sin. Christ brought to mankind the promise of everlasting life. And we come to you as ambassadors for Christ. We bring you his message as once he brought it to us. You spoke of everlasting life. I'd like to hear more about this. Christ. Tomorrow is the Sabbath. Come to our meeting place and learn more of our Lord and his teachings. Your meeting place? Yes. In the home of Simeon, near the street of the colonnades. Very well. I'll come. Both of you are welcome if you wish to come and learn of Christ. And now, peace be with you. Saul. I, I watched their faces as you spoke, and it seemed as though a light shone suddenly in their eyes. It is that way always when people first hear of Jesus. I'm glad I came to Antioch with you, Saul, and that I saw what happened just now. Melita, if you'd only listen to me, if you'd only believe that it isn't important, Please, Aram, let's not quarrel anymore. Oh, Mark. Saul. 
Paul. I'm so glad you've come home. It's good to be back, Melita. Welcome, Saul. I've been expecting you for days, hoping you'd return soon. Thank you, Aaron. We came as soon as the famine in Jerusalem was over. John Mark returned with us to help in our ministry. I'll be glad to see him. Why don't you go and see him now? But... Uh, yes, of course. I, I must welcome him. And now, my child. Tell me why you and Aram are quarreling. How did you know? It wasn't difficult to see. Your tears and Aram's angry frown made it quite clear. I've needed your advice, Saul. I'm glad you've come back. Aram wants me to marry him. He says I'm being stubborn and unreasonable in refusing. Do you want to marry him? How can I marry him, Saul? I was a slave until you bought my freedom. And Aram is a nobleman. Aram is a follower of the way now. And he loves you, Melita. I'm sure of that. And I think you care for him. I do. But if he married a slave, everyone would despise him. That doesn't matter, my child. You're free to marry the man you love, no matter what the world may think. For in the sight of God, all men and women are equal. I may really marry Aaron? Yes. I thought you understood. I thought you knew that all mankind has been given true freedom. Thank you, Saul. I think I do understand now. Then I'll send Aaron to you. And may you both find happiness and contentment for all your lives. And the church in Antioch increased in numbers. Grecian noblemen who had once thought only of selfish pleasures and who had sacrificed to pagan gods came to hear of Jesus. And they too became followers of the way. But you have seen how many people have welcomed the gospel here in Antioch. Yes, Saul. Then surely you can understand why Barnabas and I feel we must go to other countries. I understand it, but... Why do you hesitate, Simeon? What is it you want to say? Just that some of our people feel that too many pagans have become followers of the way. Too many? If all the world knew of Jesus and believed in him, there could never be too many. I thought they knew that the word of God was to go first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. That is our mission. But if we permit these Gentiles to join us, there will be discord and dissatisfaction among our people. After all, the Messiah came to the Hebrew, not to the Gentile. This is serious. We must not let dissension grow among us. Simeon, do you agree with the others? I'm afraid I do, Saul. We can't let so many outsiders come into the church. Outsiders? Don't you know that God is no respecter of persons? In his sight, Jew and Gentile are alike. Yes, if God's word is not for everyone, then his gospel is meaningless. But these pagans have different backgrounds. They haven't the faith of our fathers. But why should one have to be brought up in our faith? Surely all who learn to love Jesus may also have faith in God. I never thought of it in that way before, Saul. Remember, Simeon, in Antioch, we are not called Jews. And we do not call the pagans who have joined us Gentiles. We are all called Christians. Christians? Yes. Although it was first given us in derision, it has even now become a name which signifies our love and our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ and his teachings. You're right, Saul. May our Lord forgive me. As the disciples ministered to the Lord, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So Saul and Barnabas, taking with them John Mark, set out without fear on their first missionary journey. 
to carry the word of God to a pagan world.